Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another special edition of The Laugh Track with Jerry Strauss. He is I, I am him, and this is part of our very special series, our very special look at one of the greatest comedies flat out of all time. Uh, we know it, love it, remember it. 20 plus years later, we are now celebrating it all over again on Hulu. You can catch it in uh, its entirety. One full season of greatness. We're talking about freaks and geeks. And this time out, we are talking about number two. Episode number two, we're tapping the keg on beers and weirs. And who better to talk to about it than uh, one of the prime, I'll just say it, one of the prime geeks of freaks and geeks. Um, that's a compliment, by the way. He's here with us right now, Sam Levine. Let's bring him on. Sam. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> it's, it's very weird to be calling somebody a geek in any form, even in 2021, and have it be a compliment. But it's the true. The geek shall inherit the earth, my friend. We we were we were ahead of our time. What can I say? Absolutely. Absolutely. So glad to have you here. Um, what kind of buzz have you been hearing now that the show is back on Hulu on this platform where people could kind of discover it all over again. Has it been uh, has it been a bit of a whirlwind for you? It's kind of one of those crazy things where there was really only a small handful of people who knew about the show and were discovering it as it aired on television in 1999. And then that sort of went away. And then about a year or so later, it wound up being on the then Fox Family Channel. And then, you know, on basic cable and a couple people found it there and then it started to grow. And then uh, two or three years after that, it came out on DVD. And then that was kind of this big explosion of people finding it. And then when old Netflix happened, people were, you know, getting the DVDs through the mail, getting them <laughs> three discs at a time. Can you imagine that? Okay. Oh, I can watch episodes one to nine uh, on, on DVD. And then I got to send away for the other ones. And uh, and then finally Netflix had it on streaming a couple of years ago, and that was a huge explosion of, you know, me getting tweeted at, and I, I, Instagram wasn't a thing then, but you know what I mean, just like people on the street and kids would recognize me, and and it was on Netflix for a while, and then it went away, and it wasn't on streaming anywhere, um, and so it kind of had this little dip of not really being able to pick up a whole lot of new fans, but I mean it's been on on Hulu now for a month. And it is absolutely crazy to see how many people are discovering the show, especially young people. I mean, I'm getting tweets and cameo requests from 13, 14, 15 year olds uh, every other day. And it's wild to me, but but not surprising uh, because it is such a good show. And I always said it didn't matter what generation you grew up in. These themes are timeless. And it's the themes that people connect with. And so I'm, it, it makes me very happy to know that the next generation of young people has good taste. Yes. And they are being raised that way. And, you know, on the flip side, I mean, I'm going to represent the older generation. I'm in my 40s. I did not discover the show until like last year. Oh, um, wow. And I thought to myself, should I be discovering a show about high school now? Is this weird? Is this creepy? Um, I'm binging it late at night. I can't get enough of it, but it's mm -hmm. so good. Um, and we're going to get into exactly why I was hooked on this show. Okay. It has to do with this episode. It has to do with you. Um, but we're going to get there. Um, but we did want to talk to you. You know, this is uh, the second episode. It's a bit of a deep, deeper world building, if you will. I love this yeah. episode because the first, the pilot, obviously, were. We're being introduced to the family. We're being introduced to all the characters, setting things up. And now we've got an opportunity to kind of bring everybody in in this scenario, this party, and kind of see a little bit more of a, a deep look into how they act, how they interact, and uh, kind of see what their motivations are for different things. I think this is especially uh, an important episode, uh, a first building block for Neil Schweiber. Uh, I, I agree um, wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, no, I was very excited when I, I read the script uh, for this episode. You know, we did the pilot and then we waited and waited and waited, found out we were getting picked up and then waited and waited and waited. And I finally got to see the, this, you know, second script. Where is the story going with these characters beyond the pilot that at that point I'd watched a hundred times. 
uh, you know, in the interim. And uh, I was so, I was so delighted when I saw what, how they envisioned Neil going forward. And, uh, and uh, I mean, you know, the stuff with uh, Lindsay and how he has this crush on Lindsay and, uh, you know, how could anyone not have a crush on, on Lindsay? Uh, and, and so I, I really like that. And then the, the notion of he's the one trying to protect everyone uh, or at least help Sam protect everyone at this party and especially protect Lindsay. Um, I, I, I dug it, man. I thought it was great. And I was so, you know, I was, I was thrilled. And I mean, this is one of those things that only comes with the benefit of hindsight. I've, I've done a number of shows since then. And, you know, where I've been in pilots and you don't know what to expect. And if the show goes and then you see that second script and you go, Oh, okay. So that, that's how they see the character going forward. I, I, I guess I could do that. Yeah, I can make that work. But with this, there was, you know, nothing. And it's one of those things that I never would have been able to fully appreciate at the time. But in hindsight, I now have a deeper appreciation for than I ever could have. Yeah, especially, and I think this speaks a lot to people who are watching the show now for the second or third or fourth time to kind of go back and see sort of the evolution of all the characters just in one season, from episode one to episode 18, such a journey uh, for everybody. Um, and it all st starts he in the pilot, and then right here, where it fears and weirs, the second episode of Freaks and Geeks, written by J. Elvis Weinstein and Judd Apatow, and directed by Jake Kasdan. Now, the first episode, or, or this episode, I should say, first aired on October 2nd, 1999. Now, that's a very telling thing, because... I, I, in doing my research for this whole series, mm -hmm. I know off the top of my head that episode number three, the Halloween episode, aired on October 30th. So there's a lot of talk about how this show was kind of kicked around and changing time slots, not really promoted or broadcast in the best light or the best way to really grow an audience. Here's an example. We're already uh, we're only on episode two and now we're going to wait what is this like three or four weeks until the next episode so that's kind of an example of how you guys got kicked around a bit yes we did um so the gap there is uh twofold as far as i remember uh fold number one was our second episode dropped significantly in the ratings uh because uh what you're talking about october uh second and the, the week before september 25th those were saturday nights um, where TV uh, broadcast TV goes to die, as right. as I like to say, um, the 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 second fold was that was the one year NBC decided they were going to spend a fortune to air the World Series and a couple of playoff games leading up to it. So all of those were planned for Saturday nights. So none of their regularly scheduled Saturday night programming was airing. Um, oh, I've got a third fold for you. Uh, I mean, I know it's not the episode we're talking about, but the actual third episode of the series as it was shot was Kim Kelly is my friend. And that was an episode that NBC okay. deemed too hot for TV. It's too hot. <laughs> it's too out there, man. It's too intense for a Saturday night kids show. And we were like, oh, but, but this isn't a kids show. There are young actors in it, but it's for people of all ages. Um, but yeah, NBC did not feel comfortable airing that episode, so that was another part of the, well, what do we do with this third week? Ah, we'll just shelve it. Um, and then the fourth fold, uh, well, I made it all the way up to four folds, was um, the, there was a, the, the president of programming at NBC at the time, he didn't get the show. He didn't connect with it the way many other people did. And it was not important to him to make sure that it had a chance to succeed. That's so there you kind go. Kind of a tough hill to uh, to climb. Then I'd yes, imagine. yes, it was. It was four four strikes against us. And we're gonna we're gonna delve further as we go into the series in sort of the controversy. A lot of people debate online what the true order of the episode should be. Should you consider it the, the chronology that, in which they were broadcast, or do we look back and you know find the more intended? sequencing which you know that's the way i would go you know do it the way it was intended to be but um yeah the, the sequence starts to get messed up from here but um we're only in episode two we're already fighting against the uh, the tide so to speak mm -hmm. <laughs> still a great episode um and now we've established the world here we know that Lindsay 
is uh, kind of breaking out of her shell um, as a mathlete, as a as an intellectual in the school, and she's trying to explore her bad side. This is what we touched on in the pilot. Uh, Sam is just kind of trying to find his way, um, and maybe in a way grow up while at the same time maybe pause on growing up a little bit, maybe more ready for some aspects of that than others. Sure. Uh, and now this is the point, I think, where we get to dive a little bit more into what's going on with Neil and with Bill and with everybody else involved in the show. Um, uh, episode two, we're starting things out, uh, as we do often in the Weir Kitchen, uh, which is just a great, a great uh, showcase for Mr. Weir to be Mr. Weir. Um, and they're talking about how uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weir are going to Chicago. They're going to be going away for a weekend. They're planning to hire a babysitter. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay and Sam then talk them out of it, which sets up the premise for the show entirely. Um, also a great conversation about the Sex Pistols, about, <laughs> about uh, versus Elvis um, and Mr. Weir, of course. Uh, you know, I've said this before on the show, really the original snark. I mean, there's nothing that comes out of his mouth that is not just dry, sarcastic, and looking to criticize something going on in the year 1980. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I never met him, but I, I am told that that's a, a I mean, it's not, a, you know, a, a direct impersonation, but that's pretty close to how Paul Feig's dad was. Oh really? Uh, to to a degree, to a degree. Again, it's not a it's not a direct one for one, but there were aspects of the well. You know what happens to that person? They die. And, I'm and told a, he he had that kind of of sharpness to him. And that's a big part of the show infused throughout. It's just the, you know things in Paul Feig's life, to my understanding, right? Whether it's people he knew, went to school with, family. Um. So yeah. So we're now going to have the the weird children, so to speak, the weird teens home alone for a weekend and that mm. opens the door for what you may expect to come later uh, we get to the theme song of course um you know you're our first uh person that we've spoken to on this show that was actually a, a part of that opening credits uh, sequence ah. how did you feel about that because I, I think about things like that and i imagine that you filmed that very early on in the process um and the then, uh, you mean the the, the credits intro Yes, exactly. We, we shot that while we were shooting the pilot. Okay. Um, and I, I, honest to God, I think we did it during a lunch break. <laughs> okay. Like, I mean, you can kind of tell. It's not really a fancy entry. It's not a. It's not six 20-somethings dancing in a fountain in the middle of a park. Right. <laughs> if, if you get my comparison. Like, yes. we shot that in... I think they just had the cameras rolling. They had the one camera that was set and then the second camera to come in and do the push-ins for close-ups. And I think they had a cycle through three times without cutting. You That's know, it. all right, come in, sit down, pose for a picture, get the hell out of here, walk around the back, line up again and come back in. And I think we did it three, maybe four times at the most. And then that was it. Okay, we got it. We're done. Was it yeah. improvised? Was there a lot of thought that went into how you would approach that? Absolutely improvised from start to finish. There, there was no, there was no forethought. It was all about. All right, now get in here. Now smile. Now smile bigger. Now look like an idiot. Now you're confused. All right, you're too cool for this. You're way too cool for this. All right, be James Franco. Perfect. Get out of there. Like that's that's how it went. That was it. And it works so well because really everything that everybody did, um, it applied to their characters throughout the whole series. So it was a great foresight for everybody involved. It worked. Uh, well, thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, so we pick back up with the episode. Now, Lindsay is in school. Um, Nick is very upset because John Bottom died. We heard him proclaim just one episode ago that John Bottom is God. Yep. Uh, he is now dead. We do have a trivia note about the chronology of that that we'll get to uh, in a little bit. But, uh, you know, in this world for this purpose, uh, it's a tragedy for him. Yes, it is. And it's, a, it's really our first insight into just how um, obsessed he is and almost, you know, insanely so with the music world that he so desperately feels attached to, wants to be a part of. 
um, maybe not necessarily his destiny <laughs> in the end. Right, maybe. I mean, he's still a teenager, so you know, there's there's a there there's a tendency in television and film uh, to show teenagers often achieving a very unrealistic level of success, uh, especially in the arts. Um, and uh, not that that's this episode, but my favorite episode of the series is I'm with the band because I thought that that was a pretty damn authentic look at what almost always happens when a teenager who thinks they're a really great musician tries out for the local band. You're right. It was you know, real. <laughs> they get laughed off the stage. And that's that's what generally happens when you overestimate your ability as a teenager, which lots of teenagers do. So yeah, I um I I, I always dug that very much that they didn't really hold back with how Nick may have loved it, but he needed years and years more practice to get good at it. But there you go. But we didn't get those years. What can you do? We did not. Um, but we did get this emotional building block of him uh, dealing with this tragedy. Um, and now we go to the smoking patio. Uh, there's some awkwardness still, clearly, with Lindsay, with Kim. Uh, there's a joke about shoplifting uh, that, you know, Kim is really just constantly at this point poking the needle um, at Lindsay, trying to get a rise out of her. Right. Which, you know, you talked before about the uh, sort of the sequencing of the show. Kim Kelly is my friend is a pivotal uh, <laughs> moment between those two. Yes, which, it is. And we don't get to see that. I guess, you know, were you to be watching the show at that time, you would not get to see that episode until way later on in the game, unfortunately. But it was intended to be uh, a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was intended to be the, the very next episode. As you said, it, it explains a tremendous shift in the relationship between Lindsay and Kim uh, that those who did tune into the show uh, October 30th to watch were very confused about. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely some, some heat between the two of them at this point. Uh, Lindsay lets everybody know that her parents are going out of town. And uh, here we go now. Uh, that's all that the freaks needed to hear. Um, and of course, uh, <laughs> it's kegger time. Uh, there's a, uh, it's persuasion in play. Daniel is, you know, he's portrayed so early on to be just this guy who, you know, at this point, Lindsay still has a crush on him. Um, but even beyond that, I think that's sort of a superpower of this character and that he just has this sort of rough around the edges charm and charisma that he can get people to do things. He's just got that cool it factor about yeah. him. So she caves pretty easily at this point. Um, and, and also at this point now thinking about the possibility of maybe an opportunity to get a little bit closer with him, which doesn't seem to be a thought in his head. <laughs> eh, um, yeah, it's, you know, uh, who, who doesn't want to, as a, a teenage former good girl, you know, go after a real bad boy. And, uh, you know, uh, Daniel was certainly uh, a bad boy. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, that was a... That that was a plot line. I remember reading the script and going, "Oh wow! I thought I thought it was going to be a thing with her and uh, Nick." All right, and then obviously by the end of the episode, you see how it plays out. Uh, but uh, but yeah, who's who's to say had the show kept going if they might have circled around to that again? Uh, you know, and and had and had Lindsay get together with Daniel. That would have been that would have been interesting. Uh, but you know, obviously it it did that episode sort of helped set a major um, uh, dynamic between the two of them going forward that definitely becomes evident uh, in my mind two episodes later, but as it aired one episode later in Tests and Breasts, mm -hmm. uh, that the two of them have that very interesting story. But it starts at Beers and Weirs. It starts with her kind of, you know, having this major crush on him and thinking it's going one way and, uh, you know, the culmination of you know, where she, she finds uh, Daniel and Kim on her bed. Right. <laughs> now, at this point, of course, um, she's told and led to understand they are broken up. Um, and then, of course, we find out later they kind of just do that every week. So that's just their thing. 
uh, but they're never truly, truly apart. Uh, <laughs> and she didn't know that yet. So yeah, we get there as well. Um, we've got Neil, we've got Bill talking about Lindsay messing up her life. You know, I think Sam and, and friends, you know, you guys just uh, not quite sure what's going on with her. Uh, and then uh, Lindsay letting everyone know that this party is happening, which kind of furthers that thought. <laughs> what is she doing? Now we're going to have alcohol in the house. And, um, you know, now we're going right into an awareness assembly. So this is mm-hmm. ill-timed for Lindsay's, <laughs> for Lindsay's quest to bring some actual liquor into the weird household. Uh, this is amazing, this assembly, because um, it's clearly supposed to be like a like a mock improvised thing with suggestions from the audience. Mm-hmm. But also very clearly, that is bogus. It is entirely scripted. Uh, any suggestions for the crowd are ignored and they go with uh, clearly what they had rehearsed all along. Right. It's this very stiff back and forth uh, between Millie and Harris, <laughs> who are the part of the featured players here yeah and uh it's uh, you know it's very uh it's very high school is all i can say. very much it's yeah it's it's very any high school usa and uh ooh, fun fact about that so uh, mr rosso shows two photographs of uh, uh young people uh who met tragic ends because of alcohol related deaths um I don't remember the actor's name, but the young man in the photograph evidently shows up as a background actor in another episode. So, uh, eagle-eyed fans and us, we like to call him the ghost of McKinley High. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, I, you know, I have to ask you, have you come across a lot of, a lot of fan fiction related to Freaks and Geeks? Because I'd have to imagine... There's a lot, and I'd have to imagine now knowing that, that some of it veers into the supernatural. I'm sure it does. I know there is plenty of fan fiction out there. I have not read any. Um, it, you know, I, it, it, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I wish them the best. I know there's people who will enjoy it thoroughly, and I, I hope they find it. I am going to, after we're done talking, I am going to Google and try to find some fan fiction crossing freaks and geeks over to the marvel universe because terrific knowledge well um, hey linda cardellini is already in both there you go there you go oh man it's out there i know <laughs> um so you know th- this is actually an interesting character building thing for sam uh beyond anyone else i mean you know, you know your character concerned about everything as we come to find out, more specific to Lindsay, very concerned and caring about Lindsay. Your longtime crush is something that we learned about in this episode. Mm-hmm. Sam, I think this is a, a good indication of a defining uh, aspect of him, which is he's really a worry wart. Like he worries about everything. You know, he's he's scared about in the prior episode. He's scared of dancing. He's scared of going to the dance. He's scared of talking. Uh, to Cindy, he's, uh, you know, as we go on in the series, there's a lot of things that he is very nervous about. So sure. that's uh, his kryptonite, I guess. And he is very, uh, you know, this thing, this assembly worked on him. He is now scared that somebody is going to die in a in a car wreck thanks to this party. Yeah, um, I, I, I I agree. Uh, that 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 is one of his defining characteristics, but I mean, who? What nerdy teenage guy doesn't have most of those same fears? You know, I mean, I'm I'm very much of that cut from that same cloth. I remember when I was in my early teens, a friend of mine's older sister. Um, I didn't have a crush on her or anything, but like I knew her. I'd grown up around her, and she was a few years old. She's about five years older, I think. So, you know, we were in sixth grade, seventh grade. She was graduating high school, or. Uh, you know, maybe home from college. And I remember she saying she was about to go out with friends and they were probably going to be drinking. And, you know, I wasn't going to tell them like, oh, don't drink and drive or whatever like that. But I do remember having heard or read somewhere saying like, just remember you drink a full glass of water between all your drinks. You don't want to get dehydrated and messed up. Like I legitimately said that in earnest because (laughs) I cared about my friend's older sister. Nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
Just looking out for people. What? What's so bad about that? I hope uh, she appreciates it. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, so yeah, I mean that that, but that struck me as very true to life. Uh, that 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 that's the kind of thing that Sam Weir would worry about. That he would be nervous to talk to a girl because he was short and nerdy looking and underdeveloped and has no self confidence. <laughs> well. I mean, this is something that these guys tackle together, as you guys do, supporting one another, and come come up with this idea that sounds really like the worst idea ever, but it ends up working like gangbusters, which is mm. to get a, a keg of non-alcoholic beer and just switch them. Um, and miraculously, uh, <laughs> but maybe not so much of a surprise when you think about it, uh, they pull it off. They do this big switcheroo uh, yeah. with Lindsay just... You know, just barely escaping Lindsay noticing all the noise of moving this heavy keg through the house. Um, you know, I, I thought it was very impressive that that you guys knew how to uh, hook up a keg. <laughs> to tap the keg, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we must we must have read about it in uh, Playboy magazine. I don't know. <laughs> Research preparation. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so the the keg is there. Nobody is the wiser. It's a go. Meanwhile, uh, there's some mentioning from Daniel. Hey, is it okay that I invited a few cousins, a few extra people? Sure. Uh, yeah, guess so. Um, we know where that leads. I mean, that is a familiar, <laughs> a familiar trend. But uh, we 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 just have to kind of wait and see who's going to show up, which is inevitably everybody. Right. Um, so we get to the house. Uh, Everyone arrives, the party starts, and things are going well. And the thing I like about this party in general, and I was thinking about this a little bit, I love the fact that, and I don't know if it's because everyone thinks they're drunk or whatever, uh, everyone's kind of coexisting. And mm -hmm. that's the way I think real life is. Like, you think of, you know, cheesier shows that I remember growing up with, no, you know, no offense to them, but like a Saved by the Bell. You know, you've got, uh-oh, ding-dong, it's the nerds, and it's like four nerds. There's, you know, a guy named Nerdstrom or whatever. Yeah. And they go in one corner, and the jocks are all wearing football jerseys, and they go in <laughs> another corner. Um, but here, you know, everyone kind of lets their guard down, and there's intermingling. Everyone is just teenagers, and everyone is just kind of people here who just want to have a good time. So I like the portrayal of the you know, what the party would actually look and feel like. I, I agree. I think that that once again is, is so much more true to life. And that's what, that's what I think this show did that, um, you know, a, a few other shows may have, have tried, have had reached for it, but I think this was the first show about young people in school and their relationships and the realities of that, that really nailed the authenticity um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're still talking about it 22 years later um, it is how how hard it hit the nail on the head. Uh, yeah, that's that's what parties in high school looked like. I snuck into a few and yeah, I it wasn't like it wasn't like the, 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 the cafeteria at school. You weren't relegated to the same four or five people at your table every day. You could walk around and walk up to this group, and if you were bold enough, try to strike up a conversation. Or if someone were playing the piano, you could just waltz over and start, you know, singing along with them. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's that 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 was uh, something that they got that I I thought was. Uh, very true to life that, like you said, very anti the stereotypical teenage sitcom, what happens at a house party, the, the jocks over here, the nerds over here, the popular girls over there. It wasn't anything like that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned the intermingling, you mentioned the piano. That's that's one of the classic scenes of this entire deal was um, was Millie and Nick's duet mm -hmm. <laughs> at the piano. Um, uh, and uh I'm struggling to remember the name of the song because oh, it's not... Jesus is just all right by the Doobie Brothers. Oh, oh did I lose you? Uh, oh, there you. Yeah, go. we're back. Okay, we're back. It's uh, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is just all right by the Doobie Brothers. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. and it's um, it, it, you know, Millie shows up on a mission 
to show that she can get high on life That's and right. she can have more fun than anybody. She's almost being boastful about it, if you will. She's she's really throwing it in anyone's face she can. I don't need to drink. I can just get, you know, have more fun than any of you. Um, so she sits down at the piano at one point and starts playing this song loudly. And, uh, you know, Nick, this is, this is really a great look into who Nick is because we see that Nick is a nice guy. We see that, you know, I, I think at first he thinks it's funny what she's doing. But in the end, he wants to laugh with people. He's not the kind of guy that wants to laugh at people. So he wanted to instead just jump in and just create fun for everybody. That's that's who he is. That is very much who he is. Um, and that's one of my favorite scenes because uh, Sarah Hagen, who I adore, um, I have said this many times on the record, uh, she is probably the closest in real life to her character of any of the actors on the show. Uh, I mean, an absolute heart of gold on teenage Sarah Hagen. It was, it was the most precious thing you've ever seen. And, uh, and so she, of course, being very professional, learned every one of those lyrics, every line of that song and was very intent on doing it. There are a couple of times when they were shooting that, that you can see, you know, Nick, Jason Siegel, he's not on the lyrics as much as she is, and he kind of misses them, and he's trying to stay in it. That's very real. <laughs> That's very real. And it worked uh, I, well. I was there when they were shooting it, and he got a couple takes where he nailed the lyrics and a couple where he didn't nail it. And, of course, the producers of this show were like, oh, no, we need the ones where he does not nail it. <laughs> Those are the takes. Uh <laughs> So yeah, that, that that's uh, that's one of my favorite moments from the episode as well. Yeah, cheap plug, of course. Uh, very next episode, um, you mentioned uh, teenage Sarah Hagen, adult Sarah Hagen will be with us to talk about uh, tricks and treats. So uh, we look forward to that as well. <laughs> She's awesome, um, and we've had her on the laugh track uh, in the past as well. So that is going to be fun for sure. Um, and so is this episode, man, because there's so many just different little parts of this party that we get to visit. Um, I'm going to tell you about my favorite right now. This is the scene. Uh, this is the line. And it's your line that just made me say this is a show for me. Um, like anybody else, especially of, of my people, I enjoy a good self-deprecating uh, Jewish joke. And so there's nothing better to me than, uh, you know, you having this conversation and talking about how you were <laughs> you were elected to be the class treasurer and didn't even run. That was the mo- <laughs> that was that was season, uh, episode number two. And that's yeah. the moment where I said, "Yep, I'm watching all 18." That's 100%. It. Well, that right there is uh, almost certainly a credit to J. Elvis Weinstein, who co-wrote the episode with Judd Apatow. Uh, there is also another Jewish joke in there where I'm asking Lindsay what kind of music. Mm-hmm. she's probably going to play and I recommend Sabbath yes. because you know, Friday night is always a good night for some Sabbath. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, I mean, Judd and uh, uh, Jay Elvis, both uh, of, of the Semitic uh, persuasion. So uh, yeah, that's the, 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 I loved that episode for, for those two jokes. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I've had plenty of people ask me about those and quote the, I was elected class treasurer. I didn't even run. <laughs> um, that's it. I mean, that's a, I, I almost don't know if you could get away with a joke like that today. I, I don't know, but, but I'd like to think that Neil would, um, would probably have like 40 more of those jokes, like at mm-hmm. the ready at any time. Like the, like this is his Rodney Dangerfield gimmick. Like he's just, <laughs> he can just bust them out whenever he wants. One can hope. <laughs> um, uh, some other things going on in the party. Of course, we know that Bill is actually hanging out upstairs. He refuses to miss Dallas. Mm -hmm. Um, It's 1980. There's no DVR. They're not video recording anything. Like, he needs to see this thing. Um, And meanwhile, he is guarding the actual keg with the real beer uh, and ends up tapping into it and gets himself uh, (laughs) more legitimately loaded than anybody else in the entire party. Um, So that's going on. And then, meanwhile, more and more people are just filtering into the party. You see... uh, Daniel's people, some of whom are actually uh, middle-aged. <laughs> right, they're older, I believe, is how he describes them. Yeah. Um, 
and it's just getting out of control as parties like this tend to do. Um, we see uh, uh, nearly a fight break out. We, we do see nearly a fight break out. Let me tell you a little fun thing about that fight. The actor who gets into the fight with Seth Rogen, uh, I believe his first name is Clem, and um, uh, it was one of the most surreal things I've ever seen because both in the script and as we were rehearsing on the day, um, his direction was, you know, and now you're going to headbutt him. Clem is supposed to headbutt Ken, you know? And, uh, and when we rehearsed it, it was as if in some bizarre way, Clem was un either unfamiliar with or made a very interesting choice about what headbutting meant. <laughs> okay. You know, Cause we all think headbutting, you know, it's when you smash, you know, the, the blunt part of your forehead into someone else's face. Sure. But for whatever reason, again, it was either he was unfamiliar with the term headbutting or he made a very outside the box choice to him. Headbutting meant bending all the way down and striking <laughs> Ken with the very top of his head. <laughs> like, all a the way it, like a Like a, like a ram. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. We were all kind of cracking up when he was doing it. I didn't know if he was goofing with us, if it was a weird choice, if he didn't. I'll, I'll, I still don't know. I have no idea. But of course, once again, if something weird happened on the set while we were shooting, in a take, during rehearsal, during a table read, it's it wound up in the show. Of course. <laughs> That's the good stuff. There you go. <laughs> um so well, let's see what else do we have we also uh who else showed up at this party because everybody in town seemed to have eventually showed up uh <laughs> and meanwhile they're trying to keep trying to keep uh you guys are trying to keep bill from getting in, in worse trouble as you yep. inevitably find out how sick he is um and everything is just getting kind of crazy. And this is in the midst of, uh, you know, this is the point where Lindsay now walks into uh, the bedroom and finds out that Daniel and Kim are now making out on the bed. So, you know, her whole buildup in her mind, she's excited about the idea that she's putting on this party. She's looking cool for Daniel. He's doing what he wanted to do. And maybe this is the night that things kind of happen. Uh, not at all. Not even close. <laughs> no. <laughs> so... Um, suddenly she's not very interested in having this party anymore. <laughs> right. Well, I guess that was a, a, their fair way of saying, Hey, sometimes things don't work out for pretty girls too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no matter what you may think of the, you know, the, 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 the pretty girls in school, sometimes they get bummed out also. Um, and you know, we, uh, you know, you feel for Lindsay, you know, she really, she thought something was going to happen with this guy she liked and it, it went the other way. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's, it was not, it was not what she was hoping for. And anyone who's ever extended themselves as a teenager, uh, in a social setting, uh, only to have not, not just not get the thing you want to, but to get really get shut out, to really have it blow up in your face about as bad as it can. Um, that's, that's life. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, it gets even a little bit worse for her, maybe just at least from a timing perspective, because Nick, always comforting, always, you know, from the beginning, which wasn't that long ago, we're only two episodes in, but we see immediately that she's, he, he's definitely uh, interested in Lindsay. And, uh, you know, in, in a true, genuine, caring way, he wants to comfort her. Um, but, you know, in the end, he goes a bit too far um, and, uh, you know. <laughs> Gets a handful of butt, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know that's. I, too I think far. he's trying to undo her bra. I don't know that it's butt. Oh, okay, okay. I, I think that's how she asks him, "What are you doing?" He's he's trying to undo her bra. Mm -hmm. If memory serves, it's been a while. Yeah, and she, um, you know, regardless, she is not really in a place to be interested at all in in that. Regardless of whether she's interested, Nick, or yes. not. Which, and I'm not sure if she's really considered Nick seriously in that way at this point. I definitely think not. I mean, they had a couple of moments in the pilot and, in, in, you know, episode one. Uh, and it seemed like it might be leaning that way. 
but they were still just pals. You know, he definitely took a, uh, a pretty big leap of faith there without getting any real confirmation that she felt similarly about him. Uh, and, you know, again, that's not this nerd, but plenty of, you know, more popular, handsome, athletic, outgoing guys in, in high school, I'm sure, had similar situations where they, they shot their shot and, uh, and were, you know, summarily asked, what are you doing? <laughs> And for Nick, no, it was only, no. it was, it, this is the preseason. This is the first quarter. This is whatever sports analogy you want. He had more opportunity later on. So things yeah. ended up working out better for a time. <laughs> and those of you binging the show for the first time, you'll discover that inevitably as well. Uh, you know, two thing, two other things happening here. Now, you know, as we've reached sort of an emotional culmination of the show, uh, we've been realizing all this time that everyone seems to believe that they are wasted. Nobody quite grasps the fact that this is non-alcoholic beer. Uh, it's the placebo effect at its finest. And, you know, the house is starting to get kind of trashed and messed up as if everyone had lost all of their senses and inhibitions anyway, when it's really just them <laughs> acting out. Uh, but either way, it's not necessarily good news. Um and then this is where you come more into, into play in the episode again. And what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, the revelation that you've got something going on inside you, feelings for Lindsay that have been brewing for a long time. And this is where you step to the forefront. Yeah, it was a big moment for, for Neil to, to be able to help, uh, you know, because prior to that, he'd really anything that he thought he could do to help, you know, suggesting music or decorations or whatever, eh, eh, that's pretty ineffective. Uh, but he, he found himself in a situation where she was genuinely in trouble, genuinely hurting. And uh, Neil realistically doesn't, doesn't have too many real world skills. Uh, but this, this was one that he had. He was, you know, comfortable enough in himself to essentially prank call the police uh, to help get that thing shut down in a way that, you know, he just felt like Lindsay would never do that to herself. You know, she she was too cool to do that to herself. But if Neil does it, right. why not? <laughs> Neil took the bullet. You were It was almost like you were born for that moment, you know? <laughs> yeah. You were tailor-made to be the guy to pull off that perfect prank call. Thank you. I uh, We did... I don't think, with the exception of I'm very tired and I'm old, I don't know if I really remembered any of what that scripted line was. So that we, we just rolled on that. That we just rolled in that for a good three, four minutes of me just, uh, yes, I'm very, I'm very tired, very old. I have to get up in the morning. This kid's making a racket. All right, come quickly. So, so old, tired, very tired. You understand how tired I am? It was just that for three minutes. <laughs> Uh, because that's, that's how we shot, you know, that, that was the gift that they gave to us. Just roll with it. Stay in the scene, stay in the moment. We'll get what we need. We'll cut it together. We'll make you guys look good. Awesome. And it was great and it worked. And, uh, you know, in that moment, you know, Lindsay truly, uh, she recognized what you, what Neil had done, you know, certainly not reciprocating the, the same types of feelings per se, but certainly appreciative of the caring that that drove that drove Neil to do this for her, uh, and effectively, you know, putting an end to the night, putting an end to the show, clearing everybody out, and uh, you know, it was an experience <laughs> for everybody, and everybody survived. So that was nice. Mercifully, they did, and no major damage was done to the house. Um, so there it is. That's beers and weirs, uh, and uh, you know, some some notes about the show. You know, we always like to look for, you know, inevitably people who post interesting things that may be just like little, little issues with, uh, with accuracy or just things that they find about the show that are interesting to note. Um, a reference is made to the death of John Bonham, of course. Uh, he died on September 25th, 1980. So the approximate date of this episode is a week later around October 2nd or so. I didn't fact check this is that. But, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of a cool coincidence. Well, yeah, and then Tricks and Treats is Halloween, so. Yeah. 
yeah, you're right. You're right. So, yeah, it felt very uh, on schedule, I guess, despite how much your schedule was being screwed with Yeah, at the time. Um, Harold made a wise crack about the Sex Pistols, which made it sound like the band was still active. The episode was supposed to be set in 1980, but the Sex Pistols had already broken up in early 1978. Yeah, but Harold is so uncool. True. He would not have his finger on the pulse if the Sex Pistols were still together or not. Very true. Very so, true. Yeah. If it were if it were today, I'm sure he'd be talking about the Backstreet Boys. Or yes, he would assume in Sync is still out and yeah. touring. Yeah, hundred um, percent. How uncool I am! I think I, I referenced uh, Tests and Breasts and Kim Kelly as the next episode. It is Tricks and Treats, then Kim Kelly, then Tests and Breasts. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. The there, other note that was mentioned was uh, Cindy, who we forgot to mention, also popped into the party just to make Sam nervous. You know, because we we yep. didn't. It's almost like a quota for every episode. We got to freak him out uh, a, a few different ways. Um, so she showed up just for him to say, oh, hi, Cindy. Because... Yeah. And the <laughs> great is... Natasha Melnick, every, hey, she, she was and is wonderful and, um, you know, was such the epitome of the, the super pretty girl next door that is, is just so bubbly and sweet and so easy to mistake mm-hmm. her kindness and niceness for, does she like me? If I ask her to the dance and she says yes, does that mean she likes me or she's just, yeah, no, we'll go. It'll be fun. We'll go as friends. Like, and you can't read because you don't know because you're 14 and you don't have the life experience to be able to read that yet. Right. Um, and no, Natasha was great. And, and you know, every episode she was in, she was terrific. Yeah. No, but this is an interesting question, though. Um, and you're really great at explaining this stuff. So oh, let's thanks. bring it. Uh, Cindy uh, talks about herself as the designated driver mm-hmm. when she comes to the party. How is that possible? She's the same grade as Sam, so she couldn't be older than 15. Sure. Well, here's the thing. This is Michigan in 1980. <laughs> okay. Okay? This is not Chicago in 2010. Right. It's Michigan. It's 1980. It is entirely possible. This is not even like – this is like a, a suburb. Right. Okay? It is entirely possible a very confident 14- or 15-year-old girl is able to drive – and maybe she doesn't do it all the time. It's not like she drives herself to school, but maybe her friend has a car. And her friend picked her up, and on the off chance her older friend is not sober enough to drive home, Cindy knows, I'm aware of how to drive, and it's 1980 in Michigan in the suburbs. If I have to, I can be the designated driver to get these three people home. Totally plausible. There you go. Totally that plausible. Works. Loose ends wrapped up. That's what I'm um, here for. Yeah. Um, uh, one other note, funny overreaction on Neil's part. He attempts to scare Bill about the dangers of a suburban keg party by comparing it to the shocking 1978 Oscar-winning prison film Scared Straight, for anyone who yes. did not get that reference. That was a, a big cultural phenomenon back then. So that sure really was. checked out. And they've made a couple of newer Scared Straights since then, by the way, that, that resonate a little more with hopefully resonate a little more with today's youth but uh yeah man the original scared straight that was some messed up stuff <laughs> we highly encourage everyone to check out scared straight Why while not? you're at it check out uh red asphalt <laughs> it'll be a hell of a double feature <laughs> uh speaking of what to check out the soundtrack for this episode uh, we already talked about uh the the great duet between billy and nick but uh, we also had songs like Hush from Deep Purple. We yeah. had Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo, or Rick Derringer, uh, Santana, No One to Depend On, uh, Van Halen, Ain't Talking About Love, Janis Joplin's Maybe, and Do You Love Me by Kiss. So this is definitely a party soundtrack for a party episode. If you uh, have a party once the pandemic is over, I highly recommend starting your playlist with everything Jerry just said. Can't go wrong. And, uh, you know, just to flip it back to just how cool it is to be able to have Freaks and Geeks on Hulu, um, so much buzz around the fact that not only did they get it, but no issues with soundtrack clearances, everything intact. This is the way the show was meant to be watched and listened to. And and it is the only way you will ever see the show. One of the reasons it wasn't on streaming for so many years was the 
steep mountain to climb to clear all of that music. And Judd and Paul and company are steadfast in their belief the show should never air without those songs because they are integral to the authenticity of the show. So uh, hopefully it stays on Hulu forever. Uh, but if it ever comes off and it's not somewhere for a while, understand that that's why it's the clearing those music rights and how difficult and expensive it is. And um, I'm very proud of uh, Judd and Paul and company for ensuring the authenticity of the show by never letting it be put out there with a, you know, Muzak uh, soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely the right call for, for a show like this. And uh, it's worth it, you know, waiting. The wait is worth it uh, to get it uh, seen and get it visible the right way. Um, and it's been uh, such an awesome time being able to catch up on the series, such an awesome time to, you know, talk to all these people involved. Sam, it's been great to talk to you. This has been oh. definitely a highlight. And uh, Oh, my pleasure, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we thank you guys. We hope that you're checking us out episode by episode as you watch the show episode by episode. Then go back and watch us again. Listen to us. We're on all your audio platforms as well. Of course, right up here, LaughTrackPod.com. You can access everything that we do, Freaks and Geeks and beyond. And uh, that's it. So, Sam, again, thanks so much. It's been great. And uh, thank you still not moving people down at the bottom of the background. Uh, <laughs> and uh, until next time. We'll see you on the laugh track. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, wait a minute. We're still recording. I guess you left, Jerry. All right. Well, this is me saying goodbye. Goodbye.